Shalom lekulam. Welcome everybody to this new IVS initiative, Crucial Skills for Scientists. After the success we had with the big topics from top scientists, where we had really amazing, amazing scientists, uh, top notch, presenting their uh, in their research on very, very uh, different topics. Now we are launching a new initiative, Crucial Skills for Scientists. The goal here is to learn some skills that we believe are fundamental for all of us that are involved in research, uh, being PhD, postdoc, student, masters, professors. Uh, there are some skills that are key, crucial. For example, how to write a scientific paper. Uh, this is a, a absolutely vital skill if you want to succeed, succeed in the academic uh, research world. And here we have a top teacher for this, Professor Ray Boxman. Uh, I know him personally. We worked very closely on the last IBS conference. And on top of that, I got feedback from people who were his students on this uh, type of workshop. And they told me wonders about it. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy. I'm sure you're going to learn. And we have other topics lined up. And we would like to hear from you if you have specific topics that you think should be added to this uh, new series. So welcome everybody. And I wish you to really enjoy this presentation. And I wish Ray to, like my advisor, PhD advisor used to say, razzle, dazzle and impress. And let's all learn together. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's start that share. And uh, while uh, Ray is putting up his presentation, to share with us. I'll just give him a brief introduction. Um, as Daniel said, Ray is a really great choice to kick off this new series. Uh, Ray has been involved with the AVS for over two decades when as head of the plasma, he first brought that group into the IVS as a division. And I still recall his really great attention to student poster presentations suggesting guidelines for, for the proper poster composition and the presentation. And in fact, Ray has dedicated himself to this critical part of scientific development. He taught a technical writing course for PhD students at Tel Aviv University for 16 years. And over the years, he developed that passion into a sidelight of his work and is now a sought after speaker on, sci on scientific communication. He gives courses all around the world on this topic and he's published an accompanying book uh, on that together with his wife. Uh, so Ray is an emeritus professor at Tel Aviv University, where he established the plasma laboratory back in the mid 1970s. He specialized there in arc plasma for materials processing and carried out really innovative work throughout his entire career, which resulted in a number of patents and multiple publications. And from this work, he got a lot of accolades. He has a number of awards, uh, uh, including uh, being named as a fellow of both the IEEE and the International Microwave Power Institute. So uh, having said that, um, I'll let uh, Ray take it from here. We're really looking forward to learning something about scientific communication now. And I'd like to remind everyone that this is the um, first of two talks that Ray is giving on this. This is a two-part uh, session. The next one will be given uh, next week. So please write. Okay, thank you very much, uh, both to Daniel and to Sydney for the introduction. First of all, can everyone see my screen and can everyone hear me? Great, okay, thank you very much. Here's the problem. We, and by we, I mean I, you, the whole community spend a good deal of our time writing what are called research reports. And in contrast to uh, other tasks that we may have to do, typically we don't have training for it. If you're an electrical engineer and you have to use an oscilloscope, someone will teach you how to use an oscilloscope. If you are, God forbid, a material scientist and you have to use a scanning electron microscope, no one will even let you come into the same room until you've gone through some kind of indoctrination and passed some kind of test. But um, for many of us, we have not been fortunate enough to have been trained in how to write a research report. 
no, I can't do this in an hour and a half uh, that uh, I'll have a net uh, to do so between uh, today's webinar and next week. But what I do want to do is to give you some highlights uh, that will help you get started. It's not a substitute for a um, full semester course. And I know there are such full semester courses at Tel Aviv, at the Weizmann Institute, uh, at the Technion, and even at REL. Uh, if you have an opportunity to take a full semester course, I urge you to do so. And if your university doesn't have a full semester course, tell them to contact me. So what I want to do is to give you a recipe for preparing good research papers. Now, uh, I say a recipe. Uh, we all live here in Israel, and we know that, for example, there are hundreds of recipes for how to cook eggplant. Uh, Ray, can I interrupt for just a minute? Someone sent a message they don't see your slides. I'm wondering, I see them. I'm wondering if anyone else who has that problem, can they uh, put up a, a hand or something? Okay. Most people, everyone's saying they see. Okay. Okay, so, if someone is so, not seeing it, it's probably because you've chosen the wrong options on uh, on your screen. Yeah, check your options, please, because it sounds like it's not a problem with the broadcast. Yeah, okay. if, you, if you're using two screens, uh, you, you have to make sure that they're both visible. One will probably have uh, my talking head and the other will have the slides. Okay, so I wanna give you a good recipe for how to write a paper, but I want to stress that just like there are many recipes for eggplant, there are many recipes for writing a good paper as well. Now, the good thing about my recipe is that it comes with a money back guarantee. If you do it my way, it'll always be a good paper. Now by good, I mean in terms of style and organization. The content clearly is up to you. I can't help with that. By good, I mean that it'll be acceptable to the major journals in your field, be it the IEEE journals, the American Institute of Physics journals, the IOP journals, et cetera. But frankly, as far as I'm concerned, that's a low standard. The much more difficult standard, an important standard, is that the paper should be easy to read. Now that doesn't mean that it's easy to write. We have to work hard. So here's my plan. I want to give a short introduction and basically make an analogy between a research paper and a communications channel. That's because I started off my career basically being a radio engineer. I wanna talk about what you do before you begin to write. I wanna give a few tips about English composition. And then most of the talk will be centered on the research report. By research report, I mean a journal paper, a thesis, or an internal report in an institution or company. The research uh, paper typically has the following sections, introduction, method, results, discussion, conclusions, and uh, it begins with an abstract and a title. I'll talk about each of these sections individually and how they fit together. And then finally, I'll summarize and conclude with 10 commandments, that's or de Brot, for how to write a good paper. Now, a journal paper is a communications channel, just like you have a communications channel when you pick up your uh, cell phone and call your girlfriend or boyfriend. The objective of the scientific paper is to use this channel to convey information as efficiently as possible. Now, there are all kinds of communication channels. For example, when you use your cell phone, you have a point-to-point -point communications channel. You talk with one other person as a rule, and they talk back to you, and it has certain advantages. For example, you can provide feedback. If uh, David uh, says something to me and I don't hear him well, I can say, Dudu, say it again, okay? On the other hand, there's another kind of broadcast channel called broadcast. Okay, in broadcast, you have one transmitter. Call Yisrael, okay? 
and many, many receivers, maybe even millions of them. Now in our point-to-point -point communication system, everyone who has a phone like this, they're pretty much equivalent. They look about the same, they have about the same dimensions, approximately the same cost, maybe between a hundred and a thousand dollars, all from the same order of magnitude. On the other hand, in a broadcast channel, the transmitter might cost a million dollars. If it's a direct satellite broadcast transmitter, probably a hundred million dollars. Whereas the receivers might be cheap, a hundred dollars or thereabouts. We put a lot more effort into the transmitter than we do to the receiver. In other words, your job as the transmitter is very important, very crucial, and costs a lot of money in order that the reader's job will be easy. Just like in, let's say, radio communication, where the transmitter and the receiver have to be on the same wavelength and use the same protocol, AM, FM, whatever, okay? Likewise, we as writers have to be on the same wavelength and use the same protocol as what our readers expect. If we do, the results are usually good. And if we don't, they're usually not so good. This means that we have to know the proper protocol for writing a paper. Now, with a radio or a television transmitter, there are usually international and national standards. Uh, and this sets the protocol. Not so with a paper. There's no document that says, if you haven't written the paper exactly like this, uh, you're violating the law or something like that. It doesn't work like that. Nonetheless, there is a protocol fixed by convention. A convention, what I mean is, this is what everybody does. If we do it the same way, the chances are it'll be good. If we try to be original and do something unusual, it's a recipe for disaster. Now, we have to remember what we are writing. We're writing a scientific paper, not a murder mystery. The reader wants information, not your personal history and how you arrived at those results. Time sequences are relevant only to the extent that it affects the result. The organization, the sequence of presentation is optimized to convey information to the reader efficiently, not to make a good story. When you write a murder mystery, you only reveal who did it on the last page. We don't have that constraint. We uncover information in the sequence that the reader can most easily absorb the information. Now, the key to writing a good paper is to have, for that matter, for doing good research, is to have a well-defined research question before you begin. Every good research paper revolves around a well-defined research question. Now, there might be more than one. It might be two, maybe three, okay? But that's it. If it's already four, five, six, or a dozen, it will not be a good paper. And very likely, it won't be good research either. Here's an example of a well-defined research question. How does bias voltage affect the adhesion and interface structure of titanium aluminum nitride coatings applied to stainless steel substrates? Very specific. It ends with a question mark and it demands an answer. Now in some fields like biology and medicine, the research question is actually stated formally in the paper and it's called the hypothesis. Usually in our field, not so. It's not explicit. However, it should be implicit in what I will call phase four of the introduction, which we'll get to in a few minutes. And most important, it must be answered explicitly in the conclusions of your paper. Now, a couple of ethical issues. First and foremost is scientific integrity. When you report a result, 
that means you really got that result. You did all the things that you said you did, and that's what you got. No futzing around or burying stuff. That means that if you've had outliers, if you have results which don't conform to your theory, you still report them. You can explain away why some uh, results you're going to take into account and others you are not. Like maybe, uh, I don't know, a bird flew through your experiment at just that moment. But you don't just not report them. Second issue is plagiarism. Plagiarism is passing off as your work, either the ideas or words or data or pictures of somebody else. Everything in your report must be yours, unless you explicitly indicate by using a reference that it is not. That means you don't cut and paste anything from the web. Now, it pains me to say this, because I figured that you know graduate students should all know this very well, but I've discovered that they don't. So if this is the first time you've heard it, remember you've heard it, okay? And I hope that you, you know this anyway. Nonetheless, I'm mentioning it. And lastly, no double publication. When you publish something, you only publish it once. Now, we can debate about what is a publication. Uh, for example, a conference proceeding may or may not be a publication. It depends. But what you don't do is um, take the same paper and submit it to two journals at the same time only to one journal at one time. If one rejects it, you can submit it to the other and you don't even have to tell the other that it was rejected, but only one at a time. And once you've published it, that's it. You don't publish it again. Okay, a couple of, a couple of comments about composition, particularly English composition, though most of the rules I will state uh, apply to all languages. Scientific writing is always hierarchical. It has a top-down organization. We divide the work into chapters or sections, into subsections, maybe even sub-subsections, and into paragraphs and sentences. Before you begin to write, you should write a detailed outline down to the level of one line on the outline, giving the topic of every paragraph. And this is because that a major problem in bad writing is misplaced statements. If you just write things down in the order that they come into your mind, then you may find that you forgot to include some detail of how you got your result in your methodology section, and you throw it out in the results section. Or you get to the discussion and you realize that you forgot to give a result, so you give it in the discussion. If you make a detailed outline, you're less likely to do this. Now from the bottom up, remember that a sentence expresses a complete thought. It has to have a verb and a subject. Now in English, there's a natural word order. We give the subject first, the verb second, and then everything else, which is called the predicate afterwards, usually. You can vary this order, but there should be a good reason to vary the order. This is the default order, and it should be used, let's say, 75% of the time. Here's some examples. This, rela this relation is valid when X is greater than R. This relation is the subject, is, is the verb and everything else is the predicate. The chamber, that's the subject, was evacuated is the verb, and then everything else with a diffusion pump. Hey, that's even appropriate for the vacuum society. One of the things that uh, almost everybody can do to improve their writing, particularly in English, is to use strong natural verbs wherever you can, rather than a derived noun plus a weak generalized verb. Here's an example of what not to do. Anything in red, by the way, in my slides, means stop 
don't do it. If it's green, that's what you should do. For example, measurements were made of the coating hardness using a nano indenter. Measurements is a noun derived from a very nice verb called measure. It would be much better to write this sentence. The coating hardness was measured using a nano indenter. It's shorter and it's stronger. I don't want you to ever make measurements or perform an analysis in the papers that you write. I want you to measure and analyze. Uh, another hint is to avoid starting sentences for a long prepositional phrase. For example, using a CSEM model 3400 nano indenter equipped with a flashlight and a microcomputer, <sighs> the hardness of the coating was measured. Okay, I ran out of breath before I even got to the subject. Better would it be to put the subject right up front. The hardness of the coating was measured using, and then all of that um, additional important information. Now in English, but not all languages, for example, in Hebrew, this is not nearly as important. The paragraph has a um, distinct structure and fulfills a function. Each paragraph is like a mini composition. The first sentence of the paragraph defines the topic. Now it's usually implicit, not explicit. We don't say the topic of this paragraph is uh, micro hardness, okay? But rather the sentence itself implicitly tells you what this paragraph is all about. The subsequent sentences develop this idea in some kind of logical order. And the final sentence presents the conclusion or main point, a okets. Here's an example. In the final stage, the net deposition rate on the anode is zero. Okay, here, starting with a prepositional phrase, we are stating basically the subject of this paragraph. Here we violated the law about uh, uh, putting the subject first. And that calls attention to this phrase and lets the reader know, for example, that uh, here we can find the subject of the paragraph. And then subsequent uh, sentences develop the, uh, the, the theme. Cathodic material is either deflected by a high pressure A plasma before it reaches the anode or is re-evaporated after a very short dwell time, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, in the last sentence, we give the main point. Um, a given location on the substrate may be exposed primarily to C plasma or A plasma according to the geometry of the electrodes and the shields and the plasma flow dynamics as illustrated schematically in figure three. I'm sure everyone is using a word processor these days. I'd like to just mention a few features about using a word processor that can help you a great deal and save you a lot of time. Uh, I mean, basically you can do the 80-20 rule definitely applies to word processors. You can use 20% of the features, maybe even 10%, to do 80 or 90% of the work that you need to do. But there are a couple of features in that 20% that are important for writing a scientific paper and can really save you time. So I wanna kind of mention them. But before I mention that, the most important thing is frequently back up your work. You should save whatever you're writing at least once every 15 minutes. Most word processors have an automatic feature that does that, definitely use it. But in addition, at least once a day, back up your work on some media that's stored separately from your computer. Put it in the cloud, uh, put it on a, a disk on key, put it someplace that is stored separately in a different building if possible than your main computer. 
Boxman's first rule of computer science is that your hard drive will fail. The first uh, corollary to Boxman's first law is that it will fail two days before your deadline. So you must be prepared for this. Now about the word processor itself, learn to use styles. Styles are collections of formatting commands that you want to use under, you want to use the same commands for uh, the same purpose throughout your paper. For example, your main header, your sub uh, section header, your usual text, uh, captions, etc. Learn how to use them. Uh, you should indent and have an extra space before new paragraphs. Build it into the style. Learn how to use automatic endnote numbering. Um, Boxman's first law about reviewing papers. Your reviewer, be it your thesis advisor or an external reviewer, will always find some paper that you should have cited and you haven't. And the corollary to that law is that if you had 35 references, it'll never be where, where, where you're gonna put this new reference will be number 34. It'll always be in the first five. And it's a real pain in the butt to go through and renumber all of the references and all the places where you've referenced the references. It's terrible. Learn how to do it automatically. Do not insert extra blank spaces or blank lines. It defeats the automatic features of word processors that make your text look nice. Learn how to use the tab key to control horizontal spacing. Learn how to use tables, not just for tables, but also for the, to organize uh, your text. Use insert line and page break if needed to make stuff uh, go to the next page. Okay, now let's get down to the main uh, topic of for today, which is the organization of the research paper. Um, the typical research paper will have an abstract that summarizes the work. It'll have an introduction that answers the question, what are we talking about here? It'll have a methodology section. It might be called in an experimental paper, experimental uh, apparatus and procedure or something like that. But it answers the question, what did we do? It'll have a results section that answers the question, what did we observe or what did we get? It'll have a discussion section that answers the question, so what? And finally, it'll have conclusions where you answer the research question and maybe give one or two other points that you want the readers to remember. Now, one way of looking at this organization is through this trapezoidal diagram, where the width here indicates how narrowly or widely focused this particular section is. The introduction begins rather broadly, and as you go through it, narrows down. The body of the paper, namely the methodology and results sections, are very narrowly focused. And the discussion begins narrow, but then broadens out. So let's begin at the beginning with the introduction. Um, the introduction has four compulsory parts, general background, literature review, gap, and objective. And the vertical space here uh, indicates schematically the relative amount of volume taken up by these sections. Most of the introduction is basically the literature review. Uh, the general background is maybe one or two paragraphs. The gap and objective in a paper are probably a single sentence each. Now, the introduction and discussion are the hardest for the novice to write well. In contrast, uh, the methodology and results sections are much more straightforward. If you don't know how to get started in writing your paper, don't start with the introduction. Start with the results. It's a lot easier. Anyway, the objective of the introduction is to give the reader sufficient background information 
so that he or she can understand and appreciate your work. It basically puts your work into context and gives the reader a good starting point for understanding the details that you will present later. Besides these four required parts, there are two optional parts called value statements and a preview. Now let's look at these sections individually. The first part, the, inner, the general background, is to place the paper in very broad context and to bring the reader up to speed. Now, it should be understandable by every reader of your work. And that means you have to know who your readers are. If you're writing a paper, it depends upon the journal that you're going to publish it in. It's different if you're going to publish it in Nature, okay, or uh, uh, Review of Physics or something like that, which are rather broad, or you're going to publish it in a Journal of Left Handed Screws, okay? It has to be broad enough that everyone who would be reading that journal can at least understand the first one or two paragraphs. It should define the, top, the overall topic, not the specific topic of your, uh, of, of your paper, but the overall topic. It should be short, usually one, maybe two paragraphs, three to five sentences in a journal paper. In a thesis, it might be between a half a page and two pages. And it's usually very general, non-controversial sentences. Its only purpose is to let the reader know, in general, what is, this, what is the overall topic of this paper. Next, we get to the literature review. If the general background gave the, uh, the overall general context, the literature review puts your paper into a specific context. It sets the stage for stating what was not done previously in the gap sentence and showing by showing what was done. Now, there are three ways to organize this literature review. I mean, basically what you're doing in a literature review is you're saying what other people have done before, okay? Bergman showed such and such. Uh, Grimberg showed something else. Evenstein showed yet another thing. So how do we organize it? There are three uh, methods and you can choose whatever is appropriate for your paper. One is by approach. Um, a bunch of guys uh, did experimental work, a bunch of, another bunch of guys did simulations and a third bunch did theoretical work. So you group in one paragraph, everyone who did theory, another paragraph, everyone who did simulations, etc. You want to end with the approach which is closest to yours. Another possibility is relevance. You start with the least relevant paper and you end with the paper that is closest to what you did. And the third approach is chronological. You start with Isaac Newton and you end with the paper that you just read last week. Now I have a pet peeve and that's, please don't use reference numbers as if they are words. If you have to say these numbers, rewrite the sentence. For example, examples of crack propagation in composite materials are given in one to four. If you have to say one to four in order for the sentence to complete, write it differently. For example, Crack propagation has been previously investigated. That's a complete sentence. Where was it previously investigated? Well, we have the numbers right here, but I didn't have to say them out loud. It's a good idea to cite work by the author's name and then give the number. People will remember, uh, for example, Bergman, even more so Boxman. Okay, they're not going to remember number 32. 32 gives them no information. If they want to know the context, they have to stop reading, 
and go to the back of their paper, okay, and look at it and then go back. It breaks the whole cycle of um, absorbing information. On the other hand, if you say Boxman found or Testa found, um, they're likely to be familiar with the source and it'll mean something to them and they can remember it if you happen to mention it again. What about your own work? Clearly, if you've done relevant work, you're going to cite it in the literature review, but you should treat your own work fairly. If you have 30 references and 25 of them are from either your own work or work from your colleagues in your laboratory, um, well, I think that uh, all of your readers and especially your reviewers are gonna be suspicious. Okay, they're gonna be suspicious of, uh, does this guy really know the field? And they're gonna be suspicious of you as an investigator if uh, this is all you can come up with in a literature review is your own work. Okay, after you've stated what was done, the next part called the gap is stating what was not done. What is the justification for presenting yet another paper? Usually, in fact, it'll be because something has not yet been done, but possibly, you'll be presenting this paper because there was an error in the previous work. Well, if you're unfortunate enough to, to be in this situation, you want to be careful and tactful. Or there may be a dis disagreement or controversy between the various sources. Anyway, here is where you state what the justification for that work is. I'll concentrate on the first case, what was not done, because that's what usually happens. Though I claim this is the most important single sentence for getting your paper accepted. Why? Because a common cause, maybe even the most common cause for rejecting a paper is that the uh, reviewer doesn't think there's anything really new. A gap sentence by indicating exactly what was not done previously shows that your work is new. A good gap sentence will force the reviewer to work hard to reject your paper for lack of novel. If he thinks it was done already before, it means he has to go to the library and uh, find that reference. He can't just write, ah, this was done before. It, it, he doesn't have any credibility if he says that. And um, a sad truth is that most reviewers are just too lazy to do that. So even if your work wasn't, uh, new, if you have a good gap sentence, it might just slide by. Now, usually in a paper, this is one sentence long. It may be a few sentences in a thesis. It must be negative. It has to have a word in there like, no, not, nobody, never, etc. It must relate to the previous papers by you and your group in the same manner as all the other papers. By that, I mean, there has to be a gap right now at this instant when you are submitting this paper, not when you began your work three years ago and you've already published three papers. You have to be stating what was not done by anybody else, nor by you in those other three papers that justify writing this paper. The sentence should be explicit, precise, and focused. Here's an example. The dependence of the interface structure between titanium substrates and aluminum films on the substrate bias voltage has not yet been determined. Emphasis here on the negative word, not. You don't want this sentence to be wishy-washy. By wishy-washy, I mean, when you go to the shoot to buy a cucumber, you want a cucumber that is crisp. You go like this to break it and you hear a snap, okay? You wouldn't buy a cucumber if you got to bend it, it kind of just bends and hangs there. You want your gap sentence to be like that crisp cucumber. You don't want to say few research have investigated. 
that basically says there is no gap. Someone has already investigated this. Okay, that's not a gap sentence at all. In fact, those few researches should have been the focus of the literature review and the gap should be written relative to them. Nor do you want to begin the sentence with, to the best of our knowledge. This is a waste of exactly six words. It's your job to know the literature. And the fact that you have written these six words will not give you a pass if in fact it has been done before. There's no benefit to it all. All it does is erase doubts in the uh, eyes and ears of your reviewers and readers. Okay, the gap sentence is immediately followed by the statement of purpose. In other words, the objective. It states explicitly and clearly the objective, which will always be to fill the previously stated gap, and by the way, to answer the research question. It should be concise, precise, explicit, and focused. And by reading your statement of purpose, the research question should be implicitly clear. Here's an example. The objective of this research was to determine the dependence of the aluminum titanium interface as a function of substrate voltage during vacuum arc deposition. Now, someone who has read this statement of purpose knows that the gap was that no one has done this before. He furthermore knows that the research question is, um, how does the aluminum titanium interface uh, depend on the substrate voltage during vacuum arc deposition? You can do, if you will, something akin to a Fourier transform, which goes between the frequency domain to the time domain. You can do a Boxman transform and go from the research question to the statement of purpose, from the statement of purpose uh, to the uh, gap sentence, or in any order that you want. It contains all of the same elements, just in a different word order, maybe with a different uh, uh, verb or something like that, to make it from a question into a statement. Now, the statement, the objective of the research is never to do research. Therefore, don't use words that mean the same thing as do research, like study or investigate. Instead, use more wor words that have more tachlis to them, that are decisive, like measure, determine, construct, calculate, even understand. Now, there are two ways to write the statement of purpose. Usually in physics and engineering, we'll make the uh, statement of purpose centered on the research. And then we write it in the past tense, something like the objective of the research or project, investigation, et cetera, et cetera, was in the past tense, and then indeed give the, the objective. Alternatively, it can be centered on the paper. This is frequently done in mathematics, in which case we use the present tense. The objective of this paper or report or article, et cetera, et cetera, is. Either is okay. Uh, for IVS members, usually this will be the form that is preferred. Now, just a word about the optional parts. Statements of value. These indicate the importance or significance of the work and motivate the reader to continue reading. They should be short, one or two sentences, and generally speaking, modest, okay? Not every work on nano uh, technology is going to be a cure for cancer. Finally, the preview, again, it's optional. It's useful if you have a long paper, like a thesis maybe, uh, and if you have a paper that is not following the standard format. 
there are two kinds of previews. One is giving the principal result right up front, right here in the introduction. Remember, we're not writing a murder mystery. If we give, if we give the principal result right up front, uh, the reader kind of tunes his uh, antenna in the right direction to see how you got there. The other kind of preview is indicating the organization. And this is a very good idea if you're using something that's a non-standard organization. Like you may have had two very, very different experiments that you did. In, and when you write your thesis, you'll have one chapter that describes one experiment. It'll start with the methodology of that experiment and then the results of that experiment. And then there'll be another chapter that gives the other experiment. And then you tie it all together in, in a discussion. Alerting the reader of this up front helps him again, keep on track as he reads. Okay, up to here. Um, up to here, the uh, uh, introduction. I will begin the methodology section. I don't know that I'll finish it today uh, because I want to leave about 10 minutes for questions. And I remind everyone, same time next week, uh, I will continue and complete this tutorial. The methodology section could be called different names depending upon uh, your field and whether it's an experimental or a um, theoretical paper. It might be called experimental apparatus and procedures. In chemistry, it might be called methods and materials. I just have one request. Don't call it experimental. Experimental is an adjective and the title must include a noun. You could call it experimental details if you wish. In a theoretical paper, which I'll talk about separately, uh, we were answering the same question of what did I do in sections that might be called development of the uh, theoretical model or uh, 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 development of the model equations, etc. Now, a question that is frequently asked is how much detail do I have to give? And there's an absolute answer. You absolutely must include sufficient detail so that every result that is presented can be duplicated elsewhere. Now, I'm not talking about being duplicated by your plumber or your electrician or by your carrot bite or a non-professional, but by a first year master's degree student. That should be the level that you're aiming at. This means that if you have some secrets that you don't want to divulge, but you need to use those secrets to get your results, don't publish a paper. Keep your secret. It's also nice to report details which would help your readers. On the other hand, you want to eliminate extraneous details, things that everyone knows. O-rings and nuts and bolts don't need it. Now, in experimental papers, we're usually talking about uh, experimental apparatus and experimental procedure. We start with the apparatus. We make a differentiation between standard or well-known apparatus, which it's sufficient to mention or define and giving it a reference as appropriate, or non-standard equipment. Here we have to describe it. We describe it by defining its purpose, giving a brief overall description, probably using a diagram, describing its parts in some logical order, either following the signal or the material flow or geometrical, left to right, top to bottom, et cetera. And then how does the whole thing work together? How do these parts operate together in order to perform the purpose of the apparatus? If you have a diagram, it should be schematic should only show the parts necessary to understand operation. This means never use a workshop diagram. They're too detailed and the lines are too thin. Likewise, don't use a photograph. Schematic diagram. All the parts mentioned in the text should be labeled in the diagram. And all unusual parts in the diagram should be described in the text. Here's an example of a good diagram using what I call heads-up display. All the parts 
are labeled with words. If there's not enough room for words, then abbreviations that are easy to guess at. Here is what you don't want to do. If you do it like this, the reader six times has to dart his eyes back and forth between the diagram and wherever these numbers are explained. This is what you do in a thesis application. Kindly, don't do it in a paper. Okay, I think I want to stop now and open up uh, this tutorial to questions. Uh, feel free to ask anything. And uh, I will conclude uh, this presentation next week at the same time. Okay, floor is open. Kindly, if you ask a question, uh, turn on uh, your uh, picture and uh, uh, be sure to unmute. And uh, if we can't hear you, raise your hand and uh, Sydney will make sure he unmutes. You. So, um, because there are so many people, uh, we'll try just having people send it by the chat and then I'll read it out. Otherwise, we might have a cacophony of uh, 10 people talking at once. If it doesn't work, okay. we'll, yeah. That's fine, let's then. Just try that. So, uh, go ahead and, and use the chat to send a message, and Ray, you can read the chat and uh, uh, answer. Okay. I see that there's already a lot of stuff here in the chat. So, let me try to start from the the things there are not yet questions. They're, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Here's a quick one while people put things in. Is there a convention uh, when you said you should also always mention the name of the author when you, uh, instead of just the reference number, whether you use the first author or whoever the, you know, the corresponding or lead um, author is on that paper? Yes, there is. The first author. Well, first of all, if it's only two offers, I'd mention both of them. If it's a three or more, uh, just the first author. And uh, that's the convention. The first author is supposed to be the guy who did most of the work. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, I see you got a question here. Yeah, okay, uh, where to put the uh, gap sentence? Well, um, if you use the standard organization that I, I'm suggesting, and you have an introduction, and parts of the introduction are everything that I've just mentioned, then it goes exactly where I, I've mentioned, okay? the the um, You start with an overall general background, you give the uh, literature review, and then you give the gap sentence, and then you give the research objectives. If you are forced to put the research objectives as a separate section, uh, because that is what your thesis advisor or your graduate committee has dictated, then the um, uh, gap step sentence should be the last sentence of your literature review. In other words, you want to summarize the, uh, um, the, the literature review, and the last sentence of that summary ought to be what wasn't done. Okay, what about tense? Uh, it depends where. Mostly, you should use the simple past tense. There are a few exceptions. Um, when you present results, we'll talk about it uh, next week. Uh, there are three types of sentences that you use uh, called a location, presentation, and comment. The location sentence, which basically says what data is in what figure, is written in the present tense. Almost everything else goes into simple past tense. Okay, four new messages. Let's see here. How do you decide? Uh, the person who asked about tense also asked, does it depend upon journal? Yes, it does. There are a very few journals that like things to be in the present tense. I think that this is incorrect. 
uh, it sounds to me awkward, uh, but if you have a journal that demands it, then you do what they say, of course. Now, how do you decide which details belong in supplemental material rather than in the body of the paper? Uh, in my case, I worry that including all the important details for uh, reproducing results may hurt the focus and flow of the paper. Um, you can put um, some details in what is called an appendix. But I think that everything that is essential for, really essential for reproducing the results should be in the paper itself. Supplemental results, supplemental details should be things that are not absolutely essential. For example, you might be able to accomplish the same purpose using more than one computer code. You want to give the code because uh, it'll be helpful to uh, a new researcher, for example. That could go in supplemental uh, details. Uh, if you summarize the code, in other words, the principles by which the code is written uh, in uh, your uh, methodology section, that should be sufficient. Someone who is skilled in uh, the art should be able to write a code based on uh, the principles that you outline. Questions about excluding outliers. In biology versus physics, the tendency is not to report uh, all the repetitions used to observe a trend, but the best set where one can get good significance. Hmm. How to treat three to five sigma outliers in various fields, physics and biology. My, well, I don't know. It, it, first of all, I have to state that in my, my particular niche, it's almost like biology. I deal with arcs and sparks and they're very irreproducible. Uh, we, we get a lot of scatter. Uh, I think it's proper to report all of that scatter. Uh, in order to pull out of that scatter a trend, I will follow some kind of procedure and I will report what that procedure is. And I think that generally in materials and, and in physics in any event, that's the case. In biology, I don't know. I think you, you, you have to be honest and not throw away stuff just because you thought it was a bad day for your bacteria. There has to be a good reason why you throw it out. Uh, otherwise, I have the feeling that you are very likely uh, not only fooling your readers, but you're fooling yourself. Okay, is it good to give the gap sentence or the title in a question form? I would suggest not using the question form. Neither the gap sentence nor a title. Uh, I, I think it, it, it comes out better and it's more standard uh, to uh, present everything in your paper as ordinary declarative sentences. How do you decide which equations can be in line and which should get their own line? Uh, that's a good question and it's not something that I've really dealt with. I would suggest the following. Uh, only very simple stuff, stuff that is very short and very simple and readily understandable should be in line. It's better to set equations off separately. It's easier for the reader to follow and to find them later when he wants to try to reproduce your results. There are some medical journals that allow short communications type of submissions uh, under 2000 words. Uh, how should the introduction be formulated? What part of the introduction do you recommend that should be reduced? Well, first of all, uh, let me state very, very clearly that what I'm talking about right now is about the full research report. The full research report is a full, if you will, disclosure of what you did and it allows reproducibility. You don't have that 
demand in a short communications. Um, and uh, therefore, where you skip is uh, you abbreviate the uh, literature review, only give maybe cite the two or three most relevant papers. And I think you can also um, not be so complete in the methodology section. You don't expect someone to uh, reproduce your result from what you've written in a short communications. It is your responsibility, however, to follow up at some point and to fully report your uh, methodology in a full paper later. What are some ways to convey uh, the value and importance of your results and your approach? Well, one way we've already discussed, namely to give a uh, value uh, statement in the introduction. The other is in the discussion. And we'll talk about that in uh, detail uh, next week. When is it appropriate to add a future work segment to a paper? I don't think it's uh, appropriate at all. A, a paper reports on what you've done. Um, now, you can indicate the need for further work in your discussion. Uh, that, that, that is appropriate to say, we, we've answered this question, but now it's opened up another question that is certainly part of, of a discussion and uh, it can be there. Furthermore, the conclusions uh, might be called recommendations and conclusions. And a recommendation might be for uh, future follow-up work. Now, in so doing, uh, you are basically inviting any of your readers to do that work. You may be indicating that you plan to do that, but nonetheless, uh, don't be surprised if someone picks up the gauntlet that you have thrown down and uh, does exactly what you would like to do in your next paper. Okay, I don't see any other questions. There's your last chance. If not, uh, I will shut up, send the meeting back to Sydney, and uh, invite you all to come uh, next week for uh, the second part of this tutorial. Okay. In the name of all of us, thank you very much for this very informative uh, lesson. And remember, everyone, next week, same time, same channel, uh, for the second uh, half of this talk.